Well, welcome everybody to our webinar on demand management. My name is Susan Beecham, and I'm one of three optimization experts working for OpExecs. We have partnered to bring our experience to you and to help you transform in whatever way you need to become more excellent in your operations. Today, we're going to be talking about demand management. It's a very important topic. You often hear about supply chain management, but demand management is equally important. And today, Tracy Daly will be here to share with us her experience as an expert and what you need to know about how to make it a team effort to improve your overall operations. So Tracy, share with us a little bit what you've learned. Thanks, Susan. So by way of quick introduction, my name is Tracy Daly, and I'm an engineer by training. I spent the first half of my career in manufacturing and R&D, doing capital work, and then the second half of my career on the commercial side in marketing and sales and product management. And on that commercial side, I found myself drawn to demand management and helping clients build their demand management competency. And I think I love that area of work because it connects the demand generating side of the organization, marketing and sales, with the make side of the organization, the supply and operations. And I love the synergies that can be created when there's that kind of connection. So truly, demand management is a team effort. And organizations that have strong demand competency understand that power that they're creating through the cross-functional engagement. But honestly, organizations don't always start out that way. Sometimes they don't have demand planners. And I know when I first started demand planning, I was half-time demand planner and half-time salesperson. Maybe as things mature, you might have a demand planner assigned, but those interconnections, the cross-functional connects might be missing. When organizations are missing those connects or the demand planners are siloed, I often hear things like customer orders can exceed supply. That usually means to me that the demand planner is not connecting what they're hearing from sales with the supply capability. And that's really important work to make sure that we're able to make what the true demand is and balance those two. If they're not balanced, Oftentimes the customer that yells the loudest is the one that gets the product. And what I hear in that is that customer service may not be linked in to the demand planners. When customer service is adequately linked in, demand planner is working with sales and prioritizing the orders so that the right customer is getting the material that's available. Another linkage that's really critical and sometimes isn't there with marketing and with product management. Sometimes I'll hear that demand plan will say, you know, these changes were happening by my own business and they were a surprise to me in the marketplace. So let me give you an example of that. Oftentimes, marketing is going to be making changes in the marketplace like price changes or price increases. Well, that should not be a surprise to the demand planner. And we'll hear more about that in a minute. And my last one, my favorite one, I almost always hear that there are multiple versions of the same plan. So what I mean by that is finance for a given month might think they're going to be selling one number and sales might think they're selling another number and supply might be making a completely different number and demand plan has frozen yet a fourth number. And that is surprisingly normal, unfortunately. And that shows that there is real work to be done in ensuring this cross-functional connects. So before we dig in anymore, I want to take a moment just to get some lingo shared. Today, we're going to be focusing on demand management, and I want to tell you what that means to me and how it's different than demand planning and different than demand forecasting. So in the world of demand management, there are four elements that we'll be talking about, influencing, planning, communicating, and then prioritizing and executing. Now, one of those elements, demand planning, is the action of building a plan that supply has agreed to and all of the other functions have come to believe they've gained consensus on it. That plan is built from a forecast. And the forecast is just what it sounds like. The forecast is the organization's best guess at what demand is going to be. And those signals should be coming in both internally and externally. So today, again, we're focusing on demand management. Four elements, 
and the first is influencing demand. So we talked briefly about this. This is when the business is taking actions in the marketplace to shape demand, intentionally shape demand. So businesses do this in a number of ways. And the demand planner needs to be connected to this work because these outputs from the marketing and sales and product organization to understand these purposeful actions that are being taken. Without this, the demand planner might be flying blind. So back to our price increase example. In the example that I'm thinking of, the demand planner was not aware of a price increase that happened by marketing. And marketing realized that there was a risk that they were going to lose the lowest priced customer tier, which were significant volume buyers. So the demand planner didn't realize that they were going to lose this customer base and had still maintained the higher volume in the plan. Supply made that product and they ended up not having any customers come in to meet that higher demand. So next we have planning demand. Here I have summarized this in three really simple looking steps and it is a crazy oversimplification but it's fine for our purposes today. So first, a demand planner needs to assemble multiple views of demand. And that means we're pulling together those internal and external signals that we talked about. They're quantitative and they should be coming in from sales, from marketing, from product, but maybe directly from the customers, maybe from economic indicators, getting those external signals. Hopefully statistics are involved and maybe even AI. Next, the demand planner takes those signals and puts together an unconstrained forecast. We're not constraining this yet by what we can actually make. We are putting together an unconstrained view of what the true demand is. Then that forecast is shared with everybody to make sure that there's consensus. We all agree. Then that forecast goes to supply and supply says, whether they can make the product. If they need to constrain, they do that. And the demand planner prioritizes one customer over another to make sure that the right customers are getting the material that's available. Now we have a constrained demand plan. That's the meatiest step. But once you get a plan, you have to communicate it and communicate it well. So right up at the top here, you see my very first principle is one set of numbers. That cross-functional organization needs to be working off the same set of numbers, and that will reduce the churn and havoc that happens when we're not sharing the same basis. The other thing that's really critical in communication is to hold a demand review. The demand review should have the cross-functional team sitting together Together and sharing their voices, there may be some constructive conflict happening. We're talking about the risks, we're talking about the assumptions behind the forecast so that we can get to a plan. Then the demand planner should be the one to represent that plan through the SNOP process and in the commercial processes. And what I love about that is that gives the demand planning role some status, and that becomes a sought after role when you realize that the demand planner has a seat at the table. Okay, we've got a plan, we've communicated, and now the customer orders are coming in. So we need to execute the demand plan. And that means that we need to do what it takes to get the customer demand met in the current month it means we're tracking orders. So we're seeing the orders that come in, but what happens if the orders are higher than the demand plan intended? So as an example, let's say the demand plan has 100 units in it, but the customer orders are 120. So what happens next is that the demand planner recognizes that we're over and needs to talk with sales and supply and customer service and do that prioritization that's so critical to the execution. The other thing that's really important here is that the demand planner needs to understand the sales policies and the order fulfillment practices. So going back to our example, let's say, again, demand plan 100 units, but now the orders are at 80. We, have, we don't have enough orders to meet our demand plan. Well, let's say your sales policies have set a 30-day lead time. If that's the case, the organization, you don't have any way to bring in an order and meet it in that current month to get to your 100 units. So the next order that comes in is going to be met the following month. Connecting the demand planner with these kinds of sales policies and the order fulfillment practices makes sure that the planner has even more firepower 
in planning the future month's demand. All right, so with all of that underway, let's say we're getting ready to build our demand management competency. Where do you go? So I think the best place to start is with our best practices. Best practices should be used to establish how the work is getting done. And those best practices may actually shift and change over time as your organization matures, and that's okay. The other thing that you get when you are establishing best practices is you get a view of a planning cycle. Write it out, and I'll show you a view of one shortly. You get to see from a planning cycle when the work is getting done, what's getting done, who's doing it. It's a really critical thing to share cross-functionally. So again, everybody understands the rhythm of the work and there's an expectation of what's going to happen next. And then lastly, there's always room for continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is driven by measuring your current performance and demand versus your best practice in that planning cycle. And when you do that well, the continuous improvement opportunities will be evident. So let me take this down to earth a little bit and give you two views. So first one is a typical planning cycle. Fairly simple view. You can see the process steps in the middle. So these are the process steps that will be used to take that demand plan through a cycle. A cycle, let's say a typical cycle workday, 21 workdays. And here we also have a view of the inputs and outputs that are critical to those process steps. But the other fun thing to do, and it gets complex though, is to overlay the cross-functional team on top of here so that you can see who's supposed to be doing what. That takes a little bit of finagling, but it's worth the effort. And then I was talking about continuous improvement. It's really fun to see how an organization measures up in their demand competency versus the best practices. And I'm realizing I'm saying that's fun, but that's fun to me. And I, <laughs> I'm um, sure that it would be fun to you as a demand planner, if you're a demand planner. It's fun to take a look at how you're measuring up and then look for those improvement opportunities. So our takeaways then, are there are four elements of demand management. The cross-functional engagement that we've been talking about ensures that everyone trusts the demand plan and is working off of the same set of numbers. We should use best practices to establish how the work is going to get done and then drive continuous improvement by measuring the current performance versus best practices. So Fidel is gonna talk with us next about an example that he's seen in the past where continuous improvement was pivotal. Fidel? Thank you, Tracy. Back in 2004, I was assigned to be the plant manager of a small fabrication facility that also had finished goods assembly. And we think back to that time period, technology was changing all around us. If you remember cell phones, um, the price had gone down drastically, everyone, had them now. Facebook had just been launched. And at the time, we didn't know it, but we were just three short years away from a global financial meltdown. So just kind of painting the picture there. Now, all around us, our customers were also in transition. They were taking their operations and leaning them out, which is just a fancy way of saying that they were taking waste out of their process. So the way that translated to us in our little shop was that we were seeing smaller quantities of orders much more frequently, much more than we could handle at the time we were caught off guard. Likewise, our key suppliers, and one in particular was a copper vendor, they were shifting their operations overseas and they were asking for much more frequent forecasts so they could meet the supply of the materials. So internally, our fab shop was just still batching in large quantities. We were making thousands of parts, using up our raw material, stacking them up everywhere. Our customers just didn't need them, didn't want them anymore. On the assembly side, we had just long time to switch from one product to another. So it's a very inefficient operations there. So kind of like you mentioned, we had silos everywhere, lots of expediting, lots of short shipments, late shipments. There was a lot of chaos, that internal churn that you spoke about, Tracy. And there was definitely silos of our team, in particular that the man planning role was out on their own. So what do we do? How do we fix this, right? Well, what we had to do is we're kind of forced into the change ourselves, right? And what we did initially was just take a look at the whole value stream and we zeroed in on this demand planning role, which had been overlooked. It had been underappreciated. 
and a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of non-value added activities. And we say, you know, this, this has got to be the, the glue that binds everyone together. We've got to make this work here. And we actually instinctively implemented the four elements that you mentioned uh, of demand planning. And this is just kind of a brief summary because it took us a year and a half to get through all this, but we had to influence. Our lead times had to get shorter as well because we had to meet our customer demand. And there's a host of things that we did. I'm not going to get into the details. That by itself could be another lunch and learn. But we, we basically changed to meet our customer's demand. On the planning side, we got out of the four walls and we went out and visited our customers to understand what they were going through, what they needed and when they needed it. And that made our plan a lot stronger, right? So we understood what needed, what was needed for us to meet that demand. On the communication side, we got much, much better cross-functional teamwork. And the demand planner was key. It was pivotal to pull all the different groups together and make sure that we were all one single set of numbers, one single plan, as you mentioned, Tracy. And then on the execution side, we went to twice daily reviews of our orders, uh, just making sure that we are prioritizing correctly. It doesn't mean that we change our plan twice a day. That, that would just not be practical. But what we did is we just made sure that we were all aligned together as one team, making sure that in the morning and the afternoon that we were just making sure that the equipment and the assembly lines were working in rhythm. So Basically, in a nutshell, that's that's my example, having lived through this. I love that example. Thanks, Fidel. Okay, Tracy, are you ready for a few questions? Sure. Okay. So the um, first one I have is about the tools that you use to create the plan. So if, if we're generating our plans using Excel, is this really the best way or the only way to get to one set of numbers, or have you seen other things used in practice? That's a good question. You know, everybody starts somewhere, right? And Excel is such a great tool. It's accessible. It's easy to get started there. As you're growing your demand competency, it's okay to start with Excel. And as you mature, you'll start to see, you'll outgrow Excel but it is an enabler in the beginning. It's hard to share. So when you're going cross-functionally, your eventual goal is to get to an enterprise system, something like SAP or OMP. They have demand modules baked in and it makes it much easier to share cross-functionally. That being said, I have done it with Excel and we've worked off of one set of numbers and there were little gurus behind moving data from one part to another into systems. It is physically possible. Excellent. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question I have is really about how do you start? So understanding that these cross-functional interactions and this teamwork is really critical. And I thought Fidel's example did a great job of exemplifying this. But how should we start? I mean, you presented a planning schedule that looks like that's what it would be like when you get to the part that you're using it. But when you're just starting, how do you start? Where would you go first? Yeah, I'm a big fan of starting with what somebody else has already learned. Go to the best practices. So people who have been through this journey have started to build best practices. But let me say, best practices in demand management are lagging the best practices in the supply competency. So supply competency has been around, you know, since the 80s and has really matured. Universities teach it, but universities are not really teaching demand management. So it's a little bit harder to find those best practices. You have to look a little bit harder. You know, I, I'm just realizing that we do have a chart here. If you're interested in learning more, I do have a course series on demand management. You can go to our OpExecs website. Love talking about this stuff. I can chat with you. There's another nice resource that we have in the U.S. Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning. It's the planning word, yeah. So IBF is another great place to go for the stewards of demand planning. Awesome. How about one last question here? When I look at your, your charts about the functions that are involved in the demand plan, I see that you don't have operations represented as one of the chevrons, if you will as part of the cross-functional interaction. Uh, why is that? Yeah, that's a conundrum, right? Because demand planners don't typically call the site, right? Or walk on the site. They're not connected to the site. Our link to the operations or manufacturing is through supply. 
So hopefully, if the organization is mature enough, there's a supply team that's already established and the supply planner or manager is the one that the demand planner is linking up with. Now, if that supply role is missing, by all means, there's somebody in operations doing the planning. So that becomes your pseudo supply planner and that's who you're linking up with. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. If you're watching this webinar and you're interested in learning more, or there's another topic you would like us to handle on a Lunch and Learn, please do let us know. You can go to our website. You can email Tracy or myself or Fidel and let us know what you'd like to hear more about. We would love to take on a new topic and have you join us. Thanks again for joining everyone. Thanks all. 